All right. Mm. Um, my name is Tracy Grimm. This is an oral history interview for the Purdue uh, Archives and Special Collections Oral History Program. Today is November 11th, 2015, and I am interviewing Mr. William Cowden. Um, and with me today is Ms. Rita Baines, the uh, Director of Development uh, for Arrow and Astro here at Purdue, and Professor Michael Smith from the History Department. Um, Mr. Cowden, thank you so much for agreeing to be to participate in our oral history program. We're, we're very uh, honored and pleased that you're able to do this. Okay, thank you. Um, our first question is a little, we, the first section of questions is a bit about um, your early life. So we, were, we would like to ask you, where were you born? Uh, where did you grow up and what was it like? Okay, I'll start out if you have a question that interrupts me anytime. Okay. I was born June 19th, 1927, and spent the first 18 years of my life living in Delphi, Indiana, which is very close to West Lafayette, 20 plus miles. Mm -hmm. So I was exposed to Purdue University early in life. My mother had been a school teacher at a country school prior, prior to marrying my father. We had attended for a short period of time Long Beach College, and after their marriage, he became an insurance salesman. Well, that wasn't very good. The depression was coming. Mm -hmm. My earliest, I think, recollections was in Delphi. We lived in a location known as the Hill with my father, mother, and my mother's mother. I remember 1931, my brother Richard was I was to some degree, an early age, I think, exposed to Purdue because my father and mother had friends in Lafayette and West Lafayette. Among one friend I remember was a gentleman, Lord Piggy Lambert, and his wife. Piggy was a basketball coach at Purdue for many years. Hmm. I think my fascination with aircraft became began early. When my father would, on Sundays, would drive me out several miles where several aircraft were located on weekends. Oh, where were, the, where were the aircraft? Yes. Wait, where were the aircraft located? Uh, about two miles outside of the town, oh. which is a small town. Oh, outside of Delphi. Uh -huh. Yeah, in Delphi. Uh-huh. Goodness. This was really in the middle of the Great Depression. Hmm. And this resulted in a family moving down downtown Delphi, which is very small. And uh, we rented a rental a block from my father's insurance company, where my mother took over his business. Several years later, my mother discovered she could return to teaching 
Irish. <laughs> I spent every day at the local library reading books and magazines for all you to aircraft and um, <laughs> scientific things. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> yeah. I look back, it's a little crazy you now. <laughs> How old were you when you were doing that? You're a teenager? Maybe? Well, I was in probably junior high school. Oh, wow. Okay. Must have been something to see. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I took lessons, five lessons. Believe it or not, they were five dollars an hour for a piper club and instructor. Wow. <laughs> the rules were very lax as to number hour, and I took I took to it like duck in the water, and I sold it within about three and a half hours. Wow. And uh, later uh, in January '52, my senior year. The U.S. Navy came to our high school and gave a test known as the Eddy test to check for aptitude to the newly radar uh, technician field. And uh, Eddy was named after a lieutenant commander, Eddy, I believe, who uh, devised the test, which really was sort of a, like a college basic college entrance uh, electrical engineering course. Anyway, I was lucky enough to pass it. And the advantage of passing it was that you would not be drafted. They would allow you to graduate from high school, and then you went to boot camp at a pay grade higher than the rest of the boots Hmm. who hated us. And (laughs) we asked the boot camp, they sent me to a Navy high school in, a, in Chicago, and a month later the Japanese surrendered, and I was sure I was going to be discharged to go to home. But they surprised me, put me on a troop train to San Francisco, a troop ship to Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and Japan. <laughs> Just then, I didn't get to Nagasaki three months or so after the atom bomb was dropped. People asked me, we were there for a day, if I bothered radiation. We didn't know anything about radiation. I, I just I tell everyone, I didn't go in the dark, so I guess I was okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, I got out uh, about a year later. I did see General MacArthur, the last sites in Japan. Uh, I returned in 46. Enrolled in the Spartansville Air Knights, Tulsa, Oklahoma. They had a one year airline mechanics license to obtain an airframe uh, engine and aircraft license. <laughs> Interesting thing happened while I was there. We got a thing from advertisement from the government, and they were selling surplus aircraft in a field 120 miles away in Oklahoma City. And they were selling them for $250 each, Stearns, which was a biplane, a basic trainer. I had never sat in one, but, uh, you know, when you're 20 years old or 21 years old, you you can do anything in the world. You're not afraid. <laughs> and I read all the service bulletins and uh, bought one and sat in it, drove back, and my first landing was... I got right into a storm going back to Tulsa and it was in a farmer's field, uneventful. Oh, yeah. uh, I kept the, the full year, the half year or so, I did fly back to Delphi and gave rides at what they call old settlers once a year. And then 
Then you drove. Then you had to drive yeah. home. Then I drive home. Wow. That's one reason I didn't take much time at the activities. Yeah. We to do social activities. The, uh, this was the days before they had computers, and everything was designed using the drafting table and the, the slide rule. ask you about uh, Dr. Zucro and, and what memories you might have of him specific personally. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I saw Dr. 
which was hydrogen, 50%, 50% of lithium base, or symmetrical type of the hydrogen. And that was much easier to handle. However, the oil days of testing, and these were huge rocket engines. Uh, we were talking about start putting out the uh, first stage uh, half a million pounds, good pounds of force. And it just galvanized propellants through lines. The red tanks, uh, 10 feet diameter, about 100 feet high, and filled. Uh, I ended up being the development engineer on the first stage of the Triton 1. 
Oh, Mr. Cowan, yeah. oh, what, what project was that? What was the name of that project? Agena. Agena, okay.
Mr. Cowden. Oh, excuse me. Um, are you on a portable phone? Your your um the the sound is starting to get a little weak. Or or would you like to take a break for a few minutes? Or can well, I, I can finish this part real fast. And then oh, now now I can. That's much better. Okay. The, the earphone has slipped down a little bit. Anyway, after two years here working with the Rolls Royce people, they, the L1011 development was completed, and they started to lay off people. And this was 19, I came down here in 1970, in 72, they had a gigantic layoff of the government on the aerospace industry. And simultaneously, it used to be, they said down here that the you could go to Douglas, or you could go to Northrop, or you could go to the many. If you got laid off in one place, there was always a job. But they simultaneously cut the budget for aerospace and airplanes, and quarter million technicians and engineers were laid off at the same time. And uh, it was very bad. And I got laid off and was out of work for a year. About what year was that? So that was about 20 years, really, from 52 oh. to 72. Yeah. Oh, so 72. I, I, I didn't want him to forget about the dinosaur project before that layoff. <clears throat> if you had any <clears throat> specific memories about oh. di dinosaur. The, the volume's a little low on your end. Um, Professor Smith was, was wondering... Uh, he, if you could say if a little bit more about the dinosaur project and and before you know before the layoffs. Yes, of course. The, uh, the dinosaur program was established at the time as a separate program. Dinosaur standing for dynamic soaring. Uh, the whole program was at that time. It didn't turn turn out that later. Uh, they were going to build a two-manned aircraft that would be boosted into orbit and 
I wonder what. Get off point there to get put on. Oh, Mr. Cowden, can yes. we could we ask you a quick a question? Yeah, I simply wonder what your contributions to dinosaur were, more specifically. Yeah, um, what what were what did you yourself work on uh, the project dinosaur? What were your um, uh, assignments? Okay, I, I was in charge of the booster engines uh -huh. because they were just designing the booster engines and the Martin engines, providing base equipment for the
entire show. Uh, there were people from the Defense Department, uh, dinosaur representatives, of course. And uh, at that time, all the people from Huntsville, Arizona, that were doing the Saturn Project. Uh, and it was turning out that even back then, the United States did not have enough money to really fund both of them. And so there was the Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Warner Von Brown, General Metellus, who was heading up to Huntsville at the time. And I understand that they worked out a bargain. At that time, the Army had their eyes on doing warfare in space, as the Air Force did. Uh, the Army also went and fly to the moon, which they did. The, so the, what they worked out was that the dinosaur would be canceled, providing Huntsville sufficient money to do the moonshot. And as a result, the Army would give up their right to wage warfare in space, and it would become an uh, Air Force role. So that's pretty much how I think it was canceled. And, and it was devastating to all this uh, on a, uh, and <laughs> me too. And it, that was in, three years later, I, I read, to, because they were starting the development, the plane of the Titan, Dinosaur was gone, Gemini had passed, uh, Gemini, of course, the main radio trip was the same significance.
career. that you do too and I'd love to give you a tour of the archives uh, Rita and I we love to show off up here um, I would love that yeah. any other questions? Uh, if you have any other questions in between all this tirade I'm just going through <laughs> uh, I'd be happy to answer well thank you very very much um, okay and also I just happen to have I found it the other day the uh, a couple of books that I'm going to send to Rita, and uh, they're handbooks that were sent out to the Air Force people that were actually flying or using these things, and it's a, it's a bound, each one is a bound book, uh, roughly four by six or seven, and maybe three quarters of an inch thick for both Titan 3B and Gemini, and then the book Propulsion only, and it gets. At one time in my life, I, I did quote everything in there. <laughs> and I looked at it the other day, and it, it's Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We would thank you very much. I I know our students would love to to see those things. Thank even, you. Even for the uninformed people in the army, I noticed here it gets in how to calculate the last day change in momentum <laughs> and span expanded and Greek letters what they mean in the formulas. It, it gets very detailed for the uninitiated. <laughs> so well, thank anyway, I think you would like that. They were printed back in. Around 64, uh -huh. uh, 65 in that area. Uh -huh. Well, thank you and, very much. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be here that many more years, and uh, I have no need for it, really. <laughs> it, it seems like another time, another place. Yeah. Uh, all, all the past. 
Yeah. Well, thank you very, very much, Mr. Cowden. And, and okay, I'll pray. As an old man, does talk too much. But, you know, <laughs> Not at all. Enjoy, enjoy. Not at all. Um,